Good morning, St. Andrews, for Sunday, the 16th of August, 2020. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Bible says, Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. We begin by singing a version of Psalm 100, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly admit that we need your help. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. You alone can save us, have mercy on us, wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Strengthen us to serve you and live our lives to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God does not want anyone to be lost, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we confess our sins. He forgives those who truly repent and believe the gospel. Therefore we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honour forever. Amen. Our service today is on the theme of our responsibility to God for the environment. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we listen to your word, give us spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may know you better, love you more, and please you in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Alma reads our first reading, Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Katie points us again to that task for humanity as we read Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 26, and then Peter Budd will preach God's word to us. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 30. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Let's pray. Creator God, open our eyes and guide our thoughts. Help us to appreciate all you've made and fully to understand our role on this planet. In Jesus' name, Amen. 25th of December 2005. We camped in a remote part of Ethiopia. By the Awash River, where it makes its way down into the heat of the Darnical Plain. A crocodile lurked under a bush by the kitchen area. The vervet monkeys stole our biscuits. And I had eaten something that upset my tummy. In the middle of the night, I staggered out of the tent to the edge of the camp where I was distinctly unwell. But then I looked up and for a moment I forgot how I was feeling, forgot everything else. For above me, the great dome of the clear African sky was filled with a vivid, vibrant array of stars. There, many miles from any electricity, from any artificial light, the sky looked much as it must have centuries ago when a shepherd boy out in the hills with his sheep contemplated the night sky. 
much as it must have centuries ago when the psalmist sang, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What an awesome God is the God who could dream all that up. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When it's just you and the bush and the vastness of the night sky, you feel very tiny small and insignificant. All of humankind, just a speck in the universe. What is mankind? Small and insignificant, and yet, and yet, if we believe the psalmist, that awesome God cares for us. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? God cares. More than that, God gave humankind a very special position. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. What a privilege that such puny creatures as us should be crowned with glory and honour. What a privilege, what a position. But it's a position that comes with responsibility. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Rulers, we've been given rule, or as it puts it in the King James Version of the Bible, dominion. Rule, dominion over the animal kingdom, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. For the psalmist, it's mind boggling that God should take beings as small and insignificant as us and give us such authority. This psalm takes us back to the beginning of the Bible, to the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, which culminates with humankind. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, in our image, in our likeness. The intention is that we reflect something of God within creation, God's image. But exactly how do we reflect God's image? That's something about which people have had all sorts of ideas over the centuries. But one answer is to be found when we read on. There's a role to perform, a job to do, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. We're God's representatives in this bit of his universe, kings of the animal world. This is reinforced in Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. A mandate, it seems, to populate, fill the earth to control, subdue it, to reign, rule over, kings of the animal world, kings of the earth. But in this world as we experience it, a world 
far removed from the ideal of Genesis 1, a world, according to Genesis 3, of pain, toil and sweat. In this world, as we experience it, kings can be good or kings can be bad. Kings can rule well or kings can be despot. Power can be used responsibly or power can be used selfishly. Rule can mean good stewardship or rule can mean unbridled exploitation. What sort of rule, what sort of dominion do we exercise in this world? Humankind has certainly been fruitful and increased in number with a global population of 7.8 billion and growing. And half of all habitable land under agriculture. Humankind has filled the earth and subdued it. But do we rule well or do we rule badly? What is human activity doing? to the earth we have responsibility for. Destruction of forests. 502,000 square miles of forest, an area larger than South Africa, lost between 1990 and 2016. Extinction of species. We don't know for sure how many species of plants, animals, fungi and bacteria there are on Earth, perhaps two billion. But we're aware of many species we've driven to extinction, from the dodo to the western black rhinoceros to the rabs fringe-limbed tree frog. Pollution of the land, plastic waste being just one visible sign of human activity turning up even in the Antarctic. Misuse of water. 2.2 billion people without access to safely managed drinking water and more than half the world's population without safely managed sanitation services. Changes to the air. If we just consider carbon dioxide, levels in the atmosphere have increased by over 40% since pre-industrial times, contributing to a measurable rise in average global temperatures, potentially leading to catastrophic climate change. This is all the very opposite of what we read in Genesis 1, where God creates richness and diversity, and it's good. There are certainly those who think, not only that we've been irresponsible in the way we've used this planet's resources, but also that Christian teaching in particular is to blame for a devastating, environmental crisis. In 1967, an American historian, Lynn White, published a paper in the journal Science entitled The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. In it, he argued, we shall continue to have a worsening ecologic crisis until we reject the Christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence save to serve man. Following from that, many have come to see Christianity as an eco-villain. And that's something we must address if we're to be effective witnesses in the contemporary world. So, was Lynn White right in saying it's a Christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence save to serve man? If we go back to the Bible, back to the source, is that what it teaches? 
Yes, Genesis 1 gives mankind rule, dominion over nature. But the context is that of being made in God's image. Our relationship with nature is intended to be a reflection of God's relationship with the world he created. A reflection of the God who thought everything up and spoke it into being. Of the God who sees it all and sees that it is good. So what sort of rule is humankind intended to exercise? Surely a rule that is responsible and caring not domineering and exploitative. Genesis 1, as I read it, certainly doesn't suggest nature has no reason for existence save to serve man. On the contrary, it implies that the prime purpose of humankind is to care for nature and in so doing glorify God. But it's a sad fact that in the world as we experience it, this world of pain, toil and sweat, we all too often seem to act more like rapacious despots than good stewards. And that reflects the nature of this world, a world characterised by sinfulness. This is a world in which our relationship with nature is broken. Our relationships with each other are broken. Our relationship with God is broken. The good news of the Bible is that there's hope for reconciliation, beginning with a renewed relationship with God that God himself makes possible through Jesus. In the Bible, in Colossians 1 verses 19 and 20, it says about Jesus, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. A theme picked up in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 19 and 20. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And so even as we look forwards ultimately to something altogether better, we have a responsibility while in this world to play our part in bringing about reconciliation. Reconciliation with God and leading from that. Reconciliation wherever possible between people. And surely also reconciliation should include doing what we can to fix what's broken in our relationships with all God's made. It's not always easy to find the best way to act in environmental matters any more than it is in matters of human relationships and social justice. We need the wisdom that comes from God's Holy Spirit. But surely Christians should be at the forefront of showing how 
to live responsibly in God's world. There are groups of Christians who seek to care for God's earth. Organisations like Arosha, who have lots of ideas for churches to get involved. But surely, caring for God's world shouldn't be an optional extra for some Christians, but a core part of what it means to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Creator God, we praise you for all that's good and wonderful in the world. Help us as individuals and as a church to hold out your message of reconciliation in its every aspect and to take seriously our responsibility to care for the planet we inhabit. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we wonder at the world that God has given us to look after, we sing from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your from the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow. Who imagined the sun and give source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. We fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim You are amazing, God Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing, God Incompatible, unchangeable you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same You are amazing God You are amazing God As we turn to prayer, first we begin with the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all mankind. We bless you for our, for our creation, 
preservation and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your amazing love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us that due sense of all your mercies, that our hearts may be truly thankful and that we may declare your praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. We pray for rulers and those in authority, especially in relation to the pandemic. Sovereign God, we thank you for your word of truth that tells us to pray for those you've appointed to be leaders in the world. We pray that they might not be proud and selfish, but that they would seek the best for the peoples of the world and that they would lead justly and not stand in the way of the gospel being shared. We pray in particular that there might be solid government in Lebanon and that other nations and people can help rebuild Beirut. And to that end, we pray that a vaccine might be produced and shared and that countries can produce food and goods and trade for the common good. We pray for peace in Belo, Russia and other countries where there are disputes over elections, for peace and fairness, not rule by force. We pray for countries that are seeking to develop rights for the original peoples, that they might not be left behind in education, housing, employment and cultural respect. We pray for the members of Parliament and House of Lords, for good laws, and for the government to remember the poor and weak, especially the homeless and those seeking asylum. Today, as we pray for the missions and missionaries that our church supports, we pray for the work of the True Freedom Trust in pastoral support for people with gender and sexuality concerns who want to be faithful to Christ. Heavenly Father, we pray for their online conferences to support and strengthen godly singleness and chastity and to help people live lives without pornography. And Heavenly Father, as we cannot do anything without your Spirit and also without self-control, we pray for you to increase and overflow these gifts in your people. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Finally, we pray for people we name in our hearts who may be suffering from bereavement, loneliness, pain or confusion, that they may know Jesus with them. We make our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus sustains the stars and planets, and with Jesus we love the planet that he has placed us on. Jesus is Lord. Come to 
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.